Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie Schatzkis. I'm a head and neck radiologist at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. Um, I'm honored to open this session on staging head and neck cancer. I want to thank uh, the program committee and especially Lou Deschamps for the kind invitation. So since I'm starting this session, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the concept of staging. So the American Joint Committee on Cancer, or the AJCC, and the uh, UICC, which is uh, more of a European agency, published joint staging uh, handbooks, which are now in their eighth edition as of 2017. And what staging does is provides uh, risk stratification that can help drive management decisions, and in particular, help us understand the patient's prognosis. And for most cancers, the stage of presentation is the most powerful prognostic factor. So staging is ideally performed in the group setting, um, and in particular, the setting of a multidisciplinary tour board that includes members from all of the specialties that are involved in the diagnosis and care of these patients. And radiology, of course, is uh, uh, an important part of that. And I would direct you to this uh, really excellent uh, article published by uh, Dr. Christine Glastonbury in radiology. And this really helps us understand what our role is uh, as uh, participants in the multidisciplinary tumor board and particularly in the uh, staging of these patients. And that will sort of prompt me to thank Christine as well as Nancy Fishbein and Doug Phillips for contributing images. So this is what uh, one of the staging forms would look Ooh. like. I have these in uh, PDF uh, format on my desktop. I would recommend strongly um, getting these. Uh, they are uh, available for free from the AJCC. Uh, and this is the one for nasopharynx. And you can see that there are um, two criteria that I have here. There is the T criteria for the uh, staging of the primary tumor above, and then the N criteria, I'm sorry, category below. And each of these have criteria. So we assign uh, these categories and we do so for tumors, nodes, and metastases by looking to see which criteria uh, are um, uh, met by our cancer on this form. And based on the above, after we've assigned T and M categories, we can then take those and assign a stage. So you can see the way the staging form works is when the T is, for example, T2 and the N is N2 and there's no metastases, this will be a stage three tumor. All right, so now let's talk about nasopharyngeal carcinoma in particular, and let's start off by looking at the interesting histology and demographics of this tumor. So the WHO uh, is, has uh, its most recent classification from 2017, and it broadly uh, categorizes nasopharyngeal carcinoma as keratinizing and non-keratinizing subtypes. And the keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma subtype is very similar to the one that we see, for example, in the oral cavity or larynx. It has a strong association with alcohol and smoking, but it represents a distinct minority. Only about 20% of the NPC is the keratinizing subtype. Um, much more common are the non-keratinizing subtypes, and they are further uh, distinguished as being differentiated and undifferentiated. And the undifferentiated non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma is the most common. There is a very strong association with Epstein-Barr virus infection, more than 95%. Rare cases have an HPV association, much less common than in the oropharynx. Also uh, very unique to nasopharyngeal carcinoma is that it is, has a strong geographic predilection. It is endemic in parts of uh, the uh, Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia, China in particular, but you can see that there's also a fairly strong incidence in Africa and nasopharyngeal carcinoma represents about 10 to 20% of childhood malignancies in Africa. Another unique feature of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is that it is primarily non-surgical disease. So the most common forms and non-keratinizing forms are highly radiation sensitive. And small early stage tumors have an excellent prognosis with survival rates uh, in the 80 to 90%. And then for later stage tumor, the addition of chemotherapy will further improve prognosis.
The primary treatment modality is radiation therapy, and in specifically, um, the current standard is to use intensity modulated radiotherapy. Whoops, I have a sensitive now, sorry about that. Um, now, um, what this does is it uh, attempts to uh, provide a very high dose of radiation to the primary tumor and spare the adjacent uh, surrounding tissues so that um, to, you maximize the dose to the tumor and minimize the morbidity that's associated with irradiating normal tissue. And to do that, you have to draw these extremely tight conformal maps around the tumor. And as you can imagine, radiology is critical for providing the mapping for IMRT. So surgery is typically only done for uh, salvage in cases of patients who have uh, failed surgery and uh, chemotherapy. So just sort of an Ill illustrative uh, case to show why imaging is critical in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And these are CT images, and we typically don't do CT to stage nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, MRI is definitely the modality of choice, but I think this case is kind of helpful. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so um, if we look at the uh, first image, uh, soft tissue axial window, and we imagine that we are looking through a scope into the nasopharynx, we can see that you know, while the mucosa may certainly look abnormal, there's very, very little contour deformity of that nasopharynx. Um, really um, not a lot of tumor bulging into the uh, nasopharyngeal lumen, but deep to that, there's more tumor. And as we look at these axial images, we can see that in fact, that right scleroid, uh, pterygoid process is sclerotic and there's widening of the Vidian canal. There's also widening foramen ovale and foramen uh, lacerum. And as we look cranially on these soft tissue windows, we can see that there is tumor both in the middle cranial fossa as well as in the posterior fossa. So really what the clinician is seeing is the tip of the iceberg and we are really um, necessary to map the deep extent of these uh, lesions. So some key anatomy. Um, the key is to look for the torus tubarius which is this cartilaginous uh, outpouching into the lateral wall of the nasopharynx. And above it, you'll find the actual eustachian tube orifice. And below it is uh, the lateral fossa of Rosemuller. So the torus tubaris is actually the cartilaginous end of the eustachian tube. And you can imagine that if there is a mass, for example, in the posterior lateral nasopharynx, it can push this up, block off the eustachian tube. And that's why a new mastoid effusion in an adult is a really disturbing sign that should make uh, both the clinician and us as radiologists look in the nasopharynx. It turns out that most nasopharyngeal carcinomas start in this lateral fossa of Rosenmuller, thereby really providing a perfect scenario for blocking off the eustachian tube, as we can see in this uh, case of a uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma arising in that lateral fossa of Rosenmuller. Some more key anatomy, um, the pharyngobasilar fascia. So the pharyngobasilar fascia is a fascial band, um, and you can see this sort of graphically illustrated on this axial MR image. It connects the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscles to the skull base and essentially provides a, a barrier to the lateral spread of disease from the nasopharynx into the adjacent parapharyngeal spaces. Oof, I am sorry. Um, so on this case of a uh, midline nasopharyngeal carcinoma, we can see that this tumor has actually respected the pharyngobasilar fascia. Um, you can almost see it uh, illustrated here with these arrows and notice how the adjacent parapharyngeal fat is maintained. Now on the same case on coronal imaging, we can see how this has essentially driven that tumor cranially um, towards up towards the skull base that it's invasing, invading the basi sphenoid into the sphenoid sinuses. But again, notice how it is respecting the lateral uh, fascial margins. There are unfortunately defects in the superior aspect of the pharyngobasilar fascia bilaterally, and that those are called the sinus of Morgagni, and that is illustrated graphically here. We can see our superior constrictor muscles, um, and uh, this defect be between the top of the superior constrictor muscles and the pharyngobasilar fascia and below the skull base. And what that does is 
provide a way for these tumors to spill out laterally into the superior parapharyngeal space. So if we look here um, in sort of the mid nasopharynx, this tumor is well bounded by the pharyngobasilar fascia. We've got intact fat planes, but as we grow cranially, we can see sort of fogging, loss of the normal fatty signal, and this tumor has spilled out through the sinus of Morgagni into the superior parapharyngeal spaces. So um, let's talk about roots of spread of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So these can spread, uh, as we mentioned, laterally through the pharyngobasilar fascia, which only provides a uh, sort of uh, incomplete barrier to it. Um, here we can see this tumor uh, is bounded well by the pharyngobasilar fascia, but this one has actually managed to permeate through the pharyngobasilar fascia into that parapharyngeal space. And of course, we know that superiorly, um, this can go through the sinus of Morgagni. Um, so now from the parapharyngeal space, the tumor can spread further laterally to the masticator space, which is next in line. And from there, cranially through foramen ovale into the middle cranial fossa and towards uh, Meckel's cave. Um, tumor can spread superiorly through the basi sphenoids as we saw uh, previously, sort of percolating through that bone. Here on a sagittal image, this uh, tumor being driven cranially and showing pathologic enhancement um, through at that basi sphenoid. And then posteriorly to involve the prevertebral musculature and um, even the clivus representing the posterior skull base for tumors that have preferential posterior uh, growth pattern. Now, once we have uh, grown posteriorly, we can then grow posterior laterally to the carotid space and that's gonna come up in a second. Um, tumor can of course spread anteriorly into the nasal cavity and from there laterally through the sphenopalatine foramen to the pterygopalatine fossa and through there to the pterygomaxillary fissure. And of course we know that the pterygopalatine fossa provides access to all sorts of important structures cranially in the inferior orbital fissure towards the orbit, but also through the vidian uh, and foramen rotundum back to the skull base. Um, and of course, perineural tumor spread, since all these cranial nerves come out through the skull base, there is the opportunity for uh, tumors to uh, access these cranial nerves. So we can see uh, here the uh, asymmetric thickening and enhancement of uh, within the Vidian canal and in foramen rotundum indicating perineural spread. Here, perineural spread through foramen ovale uh, up into intracranial compartment and Meckel's cave filled with uh, tumor from perineural spread of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And then a root of spread, which is I think less famous, but very important in those tumors that do grow posterolaterally to the carotid space. So we can see that the internal carotid artery flow void is surrounded by enhancing tumor. And as we follow that cranially through the skull base, we can still see asymmetric enhancements surrounding that ICA, all the way up to that pre petrous segment. And so this is actually an important route of spread of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, uh, one that I think I learned about way uh, too late in my career, but now I uh, look extra carefully at this. All right, so we've done a lot of the work that is necessary to uh, look at our T category. So if we look at the T criteria, I wanna point out the interesting criteria for a T category of T0. The association between nasopharyngeal carcinoma and Epstein-Barr virus is so strong that even if there is no visible tumor in the nasopharynx, but EBV uh, is present within a biopsied cervical lymph node, the tumor is presumed to be nasopharyngeal carcinoma and assigned a uh, T category of zero. T1 tumors are confined to the nasopharynx, um, T2 tumors can spread to the parapharyngeal space and the adjacent soft tissues, typically the medial lateral pterygoid and the prevertebral musculature. T3 tumors invade bony scrub structures at the skull base or the paranasal sinuses. And finally, T4 tumors have intracranial extension, cranial nerve involvement, inferior extensions of the hypopharynx, the orbit, parotid, basically the cat's out of the bag and these are very advanced uh, tumors. So um, let's look at some examples of these tumors. So here's a good example, uh, two good examples of T1 tumors. These you can see are bounded by the pharyngobasilar fascia and we can see intact uh, white 
stripes of fat, uh, this tumor growing preferentially anteriorly. This one, uh, more typical posterior lateral uh, origin from the lateral fossa of Rosenmuller, growing anteriorly into the nasopharynx, but again, note that intact uh, fat stripe T1 disease. T2 tumors can spread to the adjacent uh, parapharyngeal space and the adjacent musculature laterally to the masticator space as long as it's medial to the lateral margin of the lateral pterygoid process and then posteriorly to the prevertebral musculature. T3 tumors invade bony structures. So this one posteriorly invading the clivus and this one superiorly invading the basi sphenoid. And then finally, uh, T4 disease, very advanced. Uh, here we've got uh, a tumor that has spread laterally to the masticator space, grown up through foramen ovale. We can see beautifully on this T2 weighted image, the extent of the extracranial tumor and replacement of the expected CSF signal in Meckel's cave. And finally, uh, the appearance of cavernous sinus uh, invasion, T4 disease. All right, so uh, the uh, end categories, again, um, we refer to our forms, no reason to memorize this. N1 disease is a unilateral metastasis in a cervical lymph node, but in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, you can have either unilateral or bilateral metastases. N2 disease, bilateral metastases in cervical lymph nodes, as long as they're six centimeters or smaller and above the caudal margin of the cricoid cartilage. And finally, N3 disease, are lymph nodes that are larger than six centimeters or are in the infra high order in infra cricoid neck below the caudal margin of the cricoid cartilage. Where does NPC like to metastasize? It can go pretty much anywhere in the neck, but the most common sites are those retropharyngeal lymph nodes and the level two lymph nodes, both about equally uh, represented. But note how you can see these often in the posterior, posterior triangle lymph nodes as well. So let's look at some examples. This is uh, two cases of N1 disease, this patient with multiple unilateral nodes, but this patient with bilateral retropharyngeal lymphadenopathy, both are sufficient um, for N1 category. N2 disease, uh, these patients both have bilateral uh, cervical lymph nodes as well as bilateral retropharyngeal nodes, but of course those in and of themselves um, would still allow an N1 category. And finally, N3 disease, lymph nodes that are greater than six centimeters, that's N3A disease, or below the cricoid cartilage, that's N3B disease. Many people believe that a lymph node that is more than six centimeters in size probably represents, uh, in fact, a conglomerate of lymph nodes um, but uh, in any case, uh, a nodal mass greater than six centimeters. The, the uh, M category is uh, pretty simple. Uh, M0 is no distant metastases. M1 are distant metastases. And this gives me sort of a, a, a moment to just uh, tell the difference between the P and C uh, prefix. The C means clinical. So on the basis of the activities of the tumor board and staging, that's the assigned stage. But the pathologist is the one who ultimately makes the final uh, stage PM1 distant metastases microscopically uh, confirmed. So in summary, We've talked about how nasopharyngeal carcinoma is an air digestive tract primary that has very unique histologic and demographic features. We talked about how proximity to the skull base results in uh, a very high prevalence of skull base invasion or extension through skull base foramina or extension along uh, cranial nerves or the internal carotid artery. Um, the limitations that we discussed of physical examination, this is a difficult area to see. Uh, it's going to be typically through a scope. And then the prevalence of uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy in treating these patients with the necessity for these really tightly conformed uh, maps really necessitates precise uh, disease mapping. And that's really where we come in. Radiology um, is critical uh, to mapping these tumors. We are very important participants participants in the tumor boards um, in the staging of these patients. So thank you uh, very, very much for your attention. And uh, I think we're gonna move on next uh, to the oropharynx.